and we'll, we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for attending day two, the pre-assessment workshops for the 2023 stock assessments. Uh, we got through uh, copper and canary rockfish yesterday. Um, before we move forward with black rockfish, which is the species du jour, uh, we want to check. I wanted to check in see if there are any announcements from council staff or from the other chairs. Marlene, did you have anything for us? Um, yeah, so just process wise, I think I need to again indicate that our, it's our intention to uh, record the workshop. Um, so I've just started the record the recording and a lot of this is just so that we have a transcript uh, for notes um, for uh, future reference uh, about the workshop. Um, but I just wanted to let folks know. Um, also note in the chat, um, there's a, you know some information there that and you know folks are free to sort of um, provide questions in the chat as well. Um, I think I'll let John speak to the format of how he wants to work with a public comment and the dialogue between um, the assessment authors and and the rest of the participants. Great. Yeah. Um, let's see. So yes, uh, I think um, you know as as yesterday, uh, the format is is generally you know, a discussion surrounding these presentations. It'll be provided by the stock assessment team. Um, as we're going through, uh, you know, uh, we'll use the raise hands function under reactions um, to uh, put up a flag that you'd like to to speak to something that's uh, currently being discussed. Uh, if you have more general comments, um, we can reserve those uh, for the public comment period, uh, which we'll have at the, once the presentations are done. We'll give an opportunity for an open forum for folks to, um, you know, speak to any considerations that may not have been addressed during the course of the presentations or any other considerations that they'd like to discuss relative to the assessment species and uh, efforts to assess those stocks. So. Um, do we have any other comments from the other chairs? Any questions, any follow up from yesterday? John Field? Good? Oh, John Field is present. Yeah. Good, thank you. And Jason Schaffler? Oh, yes. Jason, I believe, is uh, actually working on some salmon things today, and he's paid his due yesterday. So, um, uh, you know, if there are any kind of questions or concerns, he'll follow up with the, the staff members themselves as he's writing things up. Um, you know, Jason, uh, John, and I will be uh, compiling a report on the discussions, more like uh, notes uh, regarding considerations that are identified that need to be addressed in the course of the um, assessment and uh, discussed further at the start panel. All right, so I think without uh, Further ado, we'll go ahead and uh, start with today's content, which we'll be discussing black rockfish. Um, these are gonna be full stock assessments um, in California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, we've got uh, the stat for this is uh, EJ Dick, Jason Cope, and Aaron Berger, along with um, ancillary folks from the states who are helping out, um, providing guidance and data, et cetera. And uh, so, the stat has let us know that they'd like to start with Oregon first, um, as it's likely to be one of the more complicated ones. We're gonna catch everybody while they're spry and alert. So, um, Jason, would that be you? Yeah, yeah, all you right, guys can hear right, me all right? Great. And you yes, can see my yes. shared, shared screen is up on the- Yes, yes, yep, presentation's, presentations up. up. Right on. Okay, yeah, so this is a presentation everyone should have um, access to right now, I'd like to thank the Copper Rockfish team for introducing me to the GitHub pages option of doing such a presentation. So thanks to them. Um, I'm going to follow something similar to what they showed yesterday. Um, we're going to walk through, uh, basically, it's just a website of all this information. Um, but the, the landing page is what you see here. And those should be posted. Hopefully, you, you can see those in the chat. I don't know if folks who joined later, do they inherit the old chat um, information, I hope so. If so, both links to Oregon and Washington are there. And if you click them, you will be taken to this landing page. And from there, you will see that you can access the old assessment 
if you click here, um, there'll be a link in, in the presentation as well to the old assessment. Um, it's good, good to have that handy if you would like to look at it. Um, and then you can click this page and this will bring you to uh, this. But before I get to that, I did want to point out this is just, this is a jackpot black rockfish. This happens to be a female, um, a really big female. We have no idea how old it is, and I don't think we get to know how old it is because the otolith, I'm not sure, was collected. Um, but herein lies the dilemma that you will see is that we have no problem encountering big uh, female black rockfish. It's just that the old ones don't seem to be um, around for either sampling or for living. And so we'll get into more of that. We touched on it a little bit, same issue with canary. So we can, if you've had uh, inspiration overnight to suggest what might be going on, we are open and welcome to that discussion at this point. Uh, this one also, black rockfish um, are strange. They are sometimes found hundreds of miles offshore as I think this one was. It was one of a couple sampled um, over uh, a couple of years. So not a lot, but sometimes they're out there and they're <laughs> really big. So that's weird. So let's step into that weirdness. We're going to go into um, some of the items that we want to present to you. And the whole purpose of this presentation, just like yesterday, is not to show you the that we have everything finished. Um, everything is preliminary and everything is up for discussion, but we will tell you so what we're leaning towards. And we would love input and local expert opinion and knowledge on anything that we show you. I want to first acknowledge um, my wonderful co-authors. Um, Aaron and I are from the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Aaron is on, in underneath some pile of hake right now. So I don't expect, I don't know, Aaron, if you're online, I don't expect him to be because he's very, very busy. But um very uh, wonderful member of the stat team, along with Allie and Leaf, um, representing the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I really, really um, uh, value that association with our state agencies who are not just full of knowledge, but are just wonderful folks to work with. In addition to these folks here, there's a plethora of other state and federal folks that are contributing items uh, to this assessment, data products and, and things. And we're going to hear uh, maybe a little from others um, about what they're pr producing for this assessment. So thank you to all contributors, everyone that's that's willing to help us figure out what to do um, and bring the best information so we can provide science-based guidance for management. All right. So we're going to walk down this website. And again, you all have this. I recommend you picking this up and checking it out um, so you can zoom in and look at things and even fast forward ahead of things to prepare yourself if you want to talk. But I'm going to walk through and just give a quick summary of the past assessment. Here is where the absolute biomass trend came in. You can see it was well above the management target. The other thing I want to point out here is that these really, really intensely small uncertainty bounds, this, this, um, this assessment went through a lot of review, a lot of iterations, and what was finally um, landed upon was a, a, a fairly strict model that was um, defined by a catchability in one of the indices. And because of that catchability being defined, it really shrinks, artificially shr shrinks the actual uncertainty. So what I'm saying here is I would not expect this level of precision in the new assessment. We will um, most likely have a lot more imprecision. That does not mean we know less than we did before. And I really want to emphasize that. Uncertainty is not an absolute measure of knowledge. It is a representation of certain things. And there's certain ways that we would love to represent uncertainty in our stock assessments um, more fully that we are limited to. And uh, one of those things mentioned yesterday was like Bayesian analyses, right? That would be an opportunity to maybe fully integrate some levels of uncertainty. There, we have limitations in what we can do. So I just want to emphasize 
that the new assessment will very likely not have this level of precision, and it does not mean it's a worse assessment than it was before. But what came out was something above target, and um, oh, sorry, this was the depletion level. Sorry, this is the relative level. That's why it's really, 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 really tight. Uh, we often see that we have more knowledge about what we think a relative number is. And this is our management target. And this would be the overfished level. So the population came out quite uh, well above that with um, a little bit more uncertainty around spawning output or the absolute scale of the, st of the population. Again, very typical uh, thing. We have less certainty about how many fish are out there versus relatively how many fish are out there. But this is still pretty precise. And again, so if you see more uncertainty in the new assessment, don't be surprised. All right. Jason, moving. Jason can yeah. I interrupt real quick? Sure. Yeah, oh, okay. well, well, before, before you speak up, I cannot see anything outside of what I'm showing you. If anyone has questions, Dr. Budrick, if you don't mind facilitating that and, and or people just speaking up, I can't see who's speaking, what's going on. So, yes, please open welcome to talk whenever you want and ask questions. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I just want to note uh, Lynn in the chat is asking about um, that. Some of these say it's the 2021 assessment for black rockfish, um, but it was the 2015 and these must be um, catch only updates. Is that right? Um, this, I believe, is coming from the 2015. OK, maybe. This, is, Lynn, do you this want to should be the 2015. Yeah. yeah, this should be the 2015. Do I say it's 2020? Oh yeah, that's me. Hey, like I said, I I uh, I thanked my uh, colleagues using the copper. That should be 2015 right there. I hope I'm using the right one. But yeah, yeah, that's 2015. Sorry about that. This is not the catch only update version. This is the actual 2015 benchmark assessment view. And Lynn, thank you for for. Uh, Making sure, yeah, yeah, this is correct. Any more clarification on that? Good. Let's, and Aaron, good to hear your voice. <laughs> You're not uh, buried in Hague. Um, so let's talk about um, what we need to do to move this uh, assessment forward. Uh, there's lots of things we need to do, right? We need to put in new data and all these things. But one of the first things we need to do is look back and understand that it's been quite a while since we did a benchmark assessment for black rockfish. And when it was done last time, it was done in a quite different version of stock synthesis. So you can see the version differences here. Um, so there were a lot of changes and there is a change log. If you are way into that sort of thing, go for it go down the rabbit hole, you can click that link and be lost for days. Um, but there are a lot of changes. So we felt like we needed to bridge and show that that these models are giving you relatively uh, similar things. And so that's what this next uh, set of information is going to show you. And there are a few different ways that we do this. One, we show you what the model was last time. We then basically import all of the same data and parameterization from that model into the new version of stock synthesis, and then we fix it. We don't let it do what it would like to, given the estimated parameters from last time, we just fix it to the values. And you can see that in this case, they are pretty much exactly the same. Now, if we free up the same parameters that we estimated in the last model, you get slightly different spawning output. Um, if you ask someone who does this uh, a lot, converting these things, this is not a big difference. Um, so not anything to worry about. And then if you look at the relative scale, these things are right on top of each other. Um, you'll notice uh, when we look at the Washington model, that one had a bit more going on with recruitments and stuff. There's a little bit, little bit more of a difference you'll see in that one. But overall, this bridging exercise allows us, allows us to feel fine moving forward. Um, it's not like we would go back and use 3.24 anyway, but this is just a just a proof of concept. We're moving forward with the 3.30 and whatever the latest version of the SS um, happens to be when we run the model and everything should be all right doing so. Okay, any questions about the bridge? 
to the new version. Great. Moving along, I want to just highlight the big issues that popped up out of the last assessment and just highlight those there. And then we can walk through and, and talk about how we um, have or will be addressing some of them. But some of the bigger things that popped up from the last Oregon assessment was the investigation and lack of the older, often greater than age 10. That's where you, age 10, 12, that's where you start to see this, this sort of um, attrition of female sex ratio versus male. Um, but it really becomes prominent um, post 20 years old where the females really just disappear uh, once they're over 25 for the most part. There are still some out there, which is the confusing part. Some of them still make it to, uh, to the finish line uh, where the males are, but certainly not that many. So very odd. Um, wondering if we could get some more insight into that. So that was one thing. Improved historical catch reconstructions. This is probably one of the places we're going to spend most of the time talking this morning about. Um, it's our area of, of great uncertainty, and we have not sorted it all out yet, but we will present to you some of the issues that we have uncovered and what direction we're moving into. And along with that is recognizing that we have, we have had in the past a habit of saying, oh, we don't know what the catch history is. Let's just double it or half it. And I think most of us realize that is a really not a super useful way of treating uncertainty in the catch history. If you treat uncertainty more um, explicitly, you're going to find different periods of the catch history probably has more uncertainty than others. And that really can change results um, in significant ways. And so just kind of thinking through, if we're going to come up with alternative catch histories, um, the fact that we might want to think about what periods have the most uncertainty. Um, Looking at a tagging study and the treatment of that um, in the past assessment and into future assessments and that prior on catchability, which was a big, big issue and, and, and kind of was a very big anchor for the last assessment. Is there an ability to kind of free that up a little bit more? Um, we'll talk about that. Evaluate a near shore survey as a potential that might benefit um, having surveys that are working together and therefore being more informative and having less of a, of a need for strong priors on things. And lastly, just talking in general about stock structure. So let's start with, let's start, start with the Jason, stock structure. Yeah. Um, before you move on, on these sure. unresolved issues from 2015, yeah. um, as the unfortunate GMT rep to that mop up panel, um, <laughs> one of the key things that still sticks in my head about it is just in general, the Oregon's, the Washington and California stocks and assessments were more similar to each other than Oregon. Yes. And, and that just didn't make sense on a number of things for me. Um, is that something you all are looking into or addressing this cycle? You know, the, I know, I just remember Oregon was considered data rich, but information poor. And it, it almost seemed like having more data and more information made it for a worse assessment overall. Um, so just mm -hmm. some of the things scratching at the back of my brain from that mop up panel and was wondering how you all are addressing those. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, one kudos to you for being brave enough to go back into that, um, that dark room and experience the, uh, the, the difficulties of that time, it was tricky. And, and I think you said it well, Oregon's an interesting situation. And you know what, this is where I wanna, I also wanna highlight the fact that um, the ODF and W staff have worked really hard for many, many years on providing information for these assessments. And it can become frustrating when you provide a bunch of different data sources and they don't all talk with each other. And it becomes a big mess of an assessment that is, uh, quantitatively data rich and then information i don't know if it's information poor but it's information confusing and um i think that's what we ran up against last time that there were some really hard decisions that had to be made because not all the data sources were able to um to to hold each other up what i think we're we're keeping our fingers crossed we're, you're going to see that we have an additional additional data this year in the form of surveys. 
um, that we hope do provide more consistency among data sets. We hope that we can kind of get at some of these signals a little bit better. And I think ultimately, and I, I agree with you, Lynn, last time, it didn't feel super great to have the, the middle uh, representation of the population kind of structured and specified in a way that was different than the bookends in, of California and Washington. And I think we're hoping that through this reevaluation of many, many years later, um, that we can bring each of these assessments into more consistent treatments uh, and and get get away from some of those difficulties you you pointed out well. So, yes, can I guarantee that none of those problems will still exist? I can't at this point, but I can guarantee that we are hoping to make all three of these areas um, definitely more. Um, in line approach wise and thinking wise, and hopefully the data are going to help us do that. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for going down that rabbit hole with me. I appreciate it. Yeah. That. Yeah. I know. Every, every, <laughs> I hope, I hope that didn't uh, create a, a level of distress in those who experienced it last time right now that now we, now we're off kilter and we can't have a good discussion. Um, but it, cause it was quite traumatic, but um Great for everyone who made it through. We're now here, and we can we can go forward, and we'll see what we can do. Um, let's start with let's start with that first thing: stock structure. We always like to revisit this. Obviously, a big topic at the council level right now in general. Um, uh, you know what? This is so weird. This is just straight up not the version. This seems to be a little bit of an older version um, of this, and I don't know. Why? Give me one second here. Maybe I just change it in this one. Um, it's possible because you will see that there is a link. Um, to. Uh, well, we'll be fine. There's plenty of stuff here. Just little little things. In the Washington one, you'll be able to click in to. This is not in review. This is in, this is published in in 2022, and you can click that link um, if you're in the Washington version of this. Um, so if you do the same thing with Washington, you come down here. You can click this, and it will take you to that paper that you can download and look for yourself. So. It is there. Um, and so there was some more recent genetics work done. And as we know, genetics can be very useful sometimes. They can tell us some really detailed stuff if they tell you something. If they don't tell you something, that does not mean there isn't some interesting structure there. And basically, what it was saying was that um, we should acknowledge that, that black rockfish uh, basically go from California all the way up into Alaska. And they are thick up into Alaska. Major, major recreational fishery, basically from Oregon northward. Um, and um, the Alaska population, once you finally get up there, um, seem to have different, a, a bit more variation in different signatures than our contiguous West Coast states of the U.S. does. But there are some genetic uh, diversity uh, patterns and other things that are very interesting. Um, but when you overlay all of the things going on with the genetics, the fact that the management history is very, very differently for different for black rockfish in each of the three states, the exploitation history is different, et cetera, it makes a whole lot of sense to keep these um, three states separate assessments and being able to get the signal of the population in the three states. So when you add all that stuff up, um, and given our limited time, I'm not going to go through every source. You can read through things. Um, we are going to maintain the three-state stock structure, and hence you will be getting three presentations this morning. Uh, fleet structure um, is going to be slightly different from last time. I think last time there was a dead and live fish fishery component, and subsequently. Looking at that and looking at the past assessment, 
here here are the two distributions from the from the live and the dead um aggregate species um the black rockfish length compositions aggregated so over all years you can see these things are extremely similar um and you don't gain a whole lot um uh making them different and the fact is it's more of a um processor category the live and dead they're caught similarly what you see reflected here and so the actual selectivity is is basically the same in those two fisheries which is why we are combining them this time around uh the trawl fishery and when i say trawl it's basically a non fixed gear uh fishery because it is there's a there are some other very minor sources but mostly a trawl fishery and it's mostly historical um, that'll be the second commercial gear. And then we get into the the bulk of what the catches are, which are boat-based recreational catches. Again, this is probably the most important um, recreational fishery um, um, on the northern west coast of the United States. And it's mostly boat-based. There are shore-based catches. And, um, and they, if we scroll down here, we will see, oh, okay, this is showing you that the fixed gear and the trawl gear uh, length comps are very different, and therefore we should do those differently. And then if we get back down to scroll down a little bit down here, and we talk about the recreational, right? Recreational shore, I mean, boat-based modes can be broken down into private boats that go out and just go fish uh, sport for themselves versus charter boats. Uh, but when you look at the length comps, they are almost identical. So again, there's no reason to break those apart. So we will put those together, keep those together. And if you look at the shore and estuary, they tend to catch smaller black rockfish, which isn't a uh, isn't a surprise. Um, they'll catch whatever's there, but they tend to encounter smaller ones than would be countered in the ocean boat fishery. And so that justifies the separation of those fisheries. So two commercial fleets, two recreational fleets. Any um, further considerations with that fleet structure? Very similar to last time. Great. Okay, so let's get into some sticky parts. Commercial landings and discards. So the big issue here is that one, black rockfish isn't a big commercial target. Uh, but historically, it has shown up as a non-target non component of some big uh, commercial gears, mainly trawl. There are, so in, in right at the beginning, or, or when we were putting together the 2015 assessment, the Kronowski et al. catch reconstruction came out. And that was a synoptic catch reconstruction for Oregon waters for for. For everything super super important sort of step forward right in putting together a historical catch reconstruction as california had done uh, a few years earlier when we were obviously we considered using that that would be a convenient thing to use um patrick myrick was um our contact for commercial catches at odfw back for the 2015, and he went through a, another really detailed analysis of the data and found um, that he came up with dip through a variety of things. And I, Allie, if I'm if there is something you want to highlight, Allie Whitman um, doing the bulk of this work here. If there's anything you want to highlight, I'm trying not to get into every single gory detail here, but there are a bunch of different additional sources, including the Kronowski report that Patrick considered when putting together this time series. This time series has a couple of components. One, there's, there's the fact that black rockfish wasn't its own category most of the time in this, in this, in this series. So you had to come up with some sort of breakout of the unknown um rockfish categories that's always a mess right we've had to always deal with that in our rockfish so there's a that, this is one of the areas where we have a large uncertainty in historical um guesses of what our removals are for any given rockfish back in the past unless it's like pop or something that had its own category so you got to come up with some species comps 
some of those years, say in the 60s or 70s, you might have some direct species comps measured. But when you go back into, like, say, the 40s, you don't, and you have to come up with some sort of guesstimate of what that comp could be. And when you look over time, those comps can be highly variable. So picking what that is is going to be very difficult and how you move backward. So you can see that different people might come up with different ways of putting that um, down. On top of that issue is the fact that we have this area called 3A. Um, this area, this catch uh, designated area, is mostly in the state of Washington, but it captures the port of Astoria as well. And what was found was that those back in the day fishing off of Astoria would often go into Washington, land fish off of Washington, or, or fish, catch fish off of Washington, and then report them landed in the port of Astoria. And there was this attempt in the last assessment to figure out how much of that actually came from Washington and not Oregon, because we have separate assessment areas. We need to assign that appropriately. You can see this big pulse right here. I think one of the big differences is that most of this pulse gets pushed over to Washington, uh, the state of Washington. And this is going to be an issue, and it's something that I personally have a real struggle believing that, and you'll see in the Washington assessment, that 700 metric tons in 1945 trawl caught black rockfish were, were accounted for off of Washington based on an apportionment of unknown rockfish based on some species comp, um, and you've never seen anything ever near that magnitude again. It just seems weird. There isn't a ton of black rockfish overlapping trawlable habitat in Washington. There's, there's a little bit, and they go to this one area where you might be able to get them. It just seems like a lot. And so what we have done is taken a step back and tried to figure out through the work of good folks in the past Revisit the species comp issue and then revisit how much in the area 3A specifically uh, would be um, a portion, uh, how much of the unknown rockfish really would be black rockfish. And then you get to the issue of apportioning how much from 3A goes back over to Washington um, because it was landed in Oregon. I personally have less of an issue with the apportionment uh, side of it, um, putting a bunch of most of it from Oregon to Washington. I feel more at, at, uh, at odds with the uh, absolute amount of black rockfish we think was taken in the trawl fishery historically. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to first invite Ali. If there's anything that I glossed over that you want to bring up, and if not, I'm going to um, – just ask anyone else if you have any other input. This is like one of the biggest things I, I think we're going to talk about today. I don't expect anyone to have all the answers, but if you have any sort of insight, your local expert opinion will be highly valued. Hello, hello. All right, I see a hand up from Allie Whitman. Yeah, Go I'm ahead, gonna, Jason, I think you did a great job um, summarizing. So um, maybe I could just take it one step further here and note that um, I don't, I don't think any, I, I don't think any of us on the stat um, are are necessarily um, considering moving forward with the Karnowski reconstruction as it currently is. Um, I think we are kind of moving more towards the direction of um, what Patrick Myrick provided for the last assessment, um, but potentially uh, modifying that or trying to improve upon that where we can. Um, so I just kind of want to clarify where, where I think the stat is at this point. Um, it, uh, the other tricky thing, and mm -hmm. Allie, thank you for clarifying that. The other tricky part of this is if we do, because basically, again, and tell me if I'm wrong, but the difference basically here is that a lot of this is getting moved over to Washington. So, but there still is this 
absolute abundance of black rockfish caught somewhere that isn't out of the question, we might have an actual lower overall assumption of how many black rockfish were actually taken in a trawl, especially in something like 1945. If that's the case, those fish were still taken. They're just not being assigned to black rockfish, and therefore they should be assigned to something else. What that should be is not clear. And so I just want to highlight the fact that this isn't just a black rockfish, potentially black rockfish issue. This is a rockfish historical catch issue um, that I don't think we're going to be able to resolve for every species but we might have to make some important decisions about black rockfish and then recognize that we we're going to have to follow up with the other rockfish, but let me get feelings on that. And this is Ali from ODF and W. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to be looking at a pretty strong research recommendation um, for a comprehensive revisit of these trawl, historical trawl landings in particular. So yeah, definitely on board with that for the future. <laughs> this is Lynn from ODFW, and I, I concur with what you and Ellie are just talking about. Great. A any other possible insights? We'll keep it. We'll keep this moving, but I don't want to to steamroll over anyone's ideas. And let me also invite folks. Sometimes you just need to think about this for a minute. Um, and even though we might move on and talk, if you want to bring this back up at any point because you got an idea or you thought through it or something, just do that um, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. I mean, th this is really less for me to present to you and more to get ideas back from you all. Um, and so we want to hear from you, if at all possible. Okay, five seconds of silence rule. Not unlike the, you drop it on the ground, you got a few seconds, you can still eat it. If I don't hear anything, I will keep moving. But speak up if you want to talk. All right, now let's move on to the recreational landings. Again, more contemporaneously, this is the more important fishery. It's what's been going on over the last 40 plus years. And because um, you see the historical trawl stuff just peter out. Um, and you can see that the two, uh, the 2015 and 2023 removal, period, uh, removal estimates here, there's not, there, there are some look in within any given year, you can see some changes, but overall, this is not a huge, massive change. Um, Ali took it upon herself to, to revisit how this is also estimated. And so this is why we're getting, this is the, the Whitman version of the um, catches that we are proposing to go with, which is this, um, whatever the cyan color. Um, and that's why it's a little bit different than what we had before. And you can read details about wh why that is. Um, one thing to note with the recreational landings is that there is a lack of, um, oh, well, I guess the, sh Shore estuary landings are, um, let's see, in rec fin, but we, you'll, we'll get to the length comps. We just don't have any idea of what's sampled there. So the sh just the shore-based stuff is a lot less certain than the ocean-based. Fortunately, the ocean-based one is much larger. And so the fact that we know less about a smaller removal um, should hopefully play through to less of a sensitivity in the output of the assessment. And here, sorry, here, this was, so this is the ocean stuff. Here's the shore-based stuff. As you can see from this point on, there's really just no recording or sampling or whatever. And so, um, you kind of just have to assume something and it's a pretty low amount. And so this average was, is what we propose to assume. And we can look at that assumption with um, sensitivity runs. 
And there's really no other big things that we thought to bring up to you for recreational landings, uh, a bit more straightforward than the commercial historical stuff. All right, moving on. Indices of abundance. There's a lot going on here, a lot of interesting things. Uh, as we uh, noted before, the, the adult tagging index was a very uh, important bit of information last time. Um, what's really exciting is that we also now have an acoustic survey. Um, and Leaf, if you're online, you feel like you want to go into anything. Um, we have that as a new absolute measure of abundance that is going to be um, similar to what the tagging index is trying to do as well. And so we're going to have an ability to kind of um, see if those those scales are at all similar. Um, and I think preliminary stuff kind of showed them to be ballpark. So that was kind of, uh, that was a, a an encouraging sign uh, there for these fishery independent surveys that we're going to put in. So this is one that we've used before. We're going to use this one. Allie is going to look into the possibility of this MPA or this Marine Reserve data set. There are no guarantees that this is going to actually be uh, useful or used in the assessment, but it's something that she's going to take a look at. No more information on that um, that I can report. There's also a Smurfs Juvenile Index for Young of the Year survey that's in these uh, reserves also going to be considered. So, um, yeah, we got some interesting uh additional data sets with additional years to, to consider there on the fishery independent side of things. One thing to note with all of these indices, we're, we're going to have a, a meeting, uh, EJ and I, Melissa Monk, Ali, um, and I believe Lisa Hillier from, from uh, WDFW and anyone else who wants to join us to kind of just get on the same page about how best we want to do our standardization of indices. There are a few ways. Back in the day, um, EJ had produced some, some Delta Glim code that, that some of us have modified and we've used for years and years and years and years. Still very relevant stuff, but we have advanced our ability to do that type of analysis um, in different ways. Um, and in Bayesian ways and so forth. And so we're gonna make we're gonna meet up and figure out how maybe best we can all coordinate going about standardizing some of the especially the fishery dependent indices. So I think we're hoping to do that in February and all get on the same page. And so that'll be a, a great opportunity. But if we look to the fishery dependent stuff, right? We have our typical uh Merck's MRF stock side um catch per unit effort type thing or orbs one used these last time. Um, have an onboard observer index, near shore logbook, right? All of these are going to be very similar um, as they are all uh, rec based things and hopefully give you similar trends, right? They're, ho they're hopefully, um, while being somewhat independent, um, well, while being independent, they're giving you similar uh, trends here to, to build off of. Um, and these are all things that were used last time. Some of them just have now a few more years. Okay. So really, I think the highlight is the acoustic survey as a new thing and the consideration of these two data, these two data sets um, as uh, more independent ones. And then the rest are what have already been in and used before, but just will be extended. Any questions on indices? Good. All right, commercial length comps, we'll just walk through here. You can see that um, these are aggregate over years. You can see we've got uh, several thousand samples. Uh, and you can see that the the fixed gear um, side of things is uh, much better sampled than the trawl stuff. Um, and you can see in the trawl fishery, right, there's a bunch of different gear types. They're kind of, they're a little bit all over the place, but again, um, for the more contemporaneous data, the trawl fishery is really, really small. So 
combining this into one fishery just is the most parsimonious thing to do. We don't want to go chase noise with low sample sizes, trying to estimate um, a bunch more different selectivities uh, for a tiny fleet. So that's what was happening with our um, commercial base length comps our recreational length comps. And you had already seen how the fleets broke out as far as what their aggregates look like. So I'm just showing you sample sizes. You can see that um, for uh, the shore-based ones, right, we get a little bit of sample, we get a little bit of an ability to figure out what maybe the selectivity is. Um, <clears throat> and then um, that just stops in the early 2000s. We have nothing else from there. So we're gonna assume that there is a constant selectivity through this whole time period and that it just keeps going forward. Um, whereas with the boats mode, you can see that um, it has been well sampled. Um, I'll let you guess what happened here in this year, but um, all the other years, lots of good samples um, to work with and construct our, um, our um, selectivity estimates and hopefully maybe even pick up some recruitment events and who knows what else. Now, one thing I, I don't think I've talked a lot about um, with the stat team, um, but I, I don't think we have, um, we are anticipating, I know bag limits changed in certain spots, and Ellie, maybe you can help me do this on the fly, but I don't think we have the expectation that we're going to have any blocking and selectivity. Is that true? Yeah, we haven't had a chance to talk about that a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on the recreational side, bag limits have decreased, um, but I would say that's a relative, uh, like at least over this time, over this 40 year time period, that's been kind of a gradual progression. Um, so um, offhand, I, I would say that we may not be recommending any particular time blocks on the recreational side. Um, I'll look to Lynn and Christian to correct me on that if my thinking is off there. Um, yeah. On the you commercial side. It. So, hey, sorry. Allie. Yes, go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> um, while the bag limits have changed a little bit here and there, mm -hmm. ranging between four and seven fish, the sampling rate, the sampling goals have no, don't change with that. So our yeah. samplers are still getting the same number of samples regardless of the, the bag limit. So yeah. your number of samples wouldn't change mm -hmm. um, even with the bag limit changes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it's it's something we are gonna consider. I don't think we anticipate it then maybe to to have time blocks, but if if we see something, we will of course in our specification of the model, take that into consideration and explore that. Um, but but good good samples, especially over the last twenty years for um, for the boat mode, the main main removal. Yeah, we might want to talk further about the commercial side as well. Um, a lot of those recent fixed gear samples are from our our live fish fishery. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, something to um continue discussing for sure yeah what one question maybe and this is again this is me thinking on the fly we haven't really talked about this but i'll just bring it out to the group here the shore base mode i think we showed very very clearly if we go back to our fleet structure how the shore and the ocean boat very different they're catching smaller ones here do we also expect them not to necessarily catch the bigger ones would we expect this to be a dome shaped and i think ultimately it's not going to make a big difference given that the removal is low, but just as just on a specifying as best as possible, the model, would there be consideration for a dome shaped selectivity in the shore estuary? Just, you just don't have the bigger ones available. It, the yeah, shore and oh, go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> the shore and estuary generally encounters much smaller fish than the yeah. ocean boat. Does. Um, so in sorry, addition Ellie, to that. But in addition to not get, seeing the big ones, like you, you wouldn't even, the big ones have probably moved a bit away from the shore and estuary. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Yeah, I think um, a dome shape selectivity for the shore estuary fleet might be something to consider. Um, 
But as you said, the removals are relatively small compared to the ocean boat fishery. Yeah, it's not going to matter a whole whole lot. I don't um, I don't mm-hmm. recall last time what was done, but um, if that wasn't done, and if we think that's appropriate this time, that could be a change from last time. But but for the most part, um, as it, when it comes to length selectivity, um, so far we're considering asset uh, logistic selectivity for these fisheries with the shore base mode may, maybe being the only possible dome shaped length based selectivity. Okay. I think that brings us to biology and there's going to be some interesting stuff here as well. Uh, I'm going to start with maturity and fecundity and we've had some really, so just historically <clears throat> the black rock fish assessment in 2015 was the first one i believe to to use this idea of functional maturity as the actual maturity curve in the assessment but last time if you recall what happened was um while the star panel had accepted the possibility of um in here maybe i should back up for a second there's biological maturity. I think we usually understand, we're usually familiar with this. Biological maturity is you look at the gonads, those look that they, they could be what I'm calling online. They could work. Therefore, that, that individual is mature, and you just measure the ones that have what looks to be working, function like functioning um, gonads, and you figure out what percentage right at length that is, and then you find the L50 and the asymptote, and you put that in as the maturity ogive. What has been developed, and Melissa Head at the Northwest Fishery Science Center um, helped do this and pioneered this last time, is that she's been doing her maturity grading in in a more um, explicit way and actually finding all sorts of signs of skip spawning, atresia, other things that cause not only um, a delayed L50, so where you think they are 50% mature actually gets pushed off to a larger length. You also get this behavior up here where older individuals may or may not actually spawn in any given year. And so there's only going to be a certain proportion, which is not um asymptotic necessarily and at one a certain proportion won't be um would have skipped that spawning and um what's even more exciting and i'm going to turn the time over um for uh so claire rosemond is a phd student at osu she and melissa are working on black rockfish maturity and doing functional maturity which follows whether something actually spawned or not and getting those proportions. They are, um, they have done this and they have found some really interesting stuff in regards to parasitic loads, um, uh, all sorts of other things that I'll let, let her talk about, but let me just finish on 2015. What, what happened was the star panel understood and appreciated this functional maturity definition and they they accepted the L50 estimate from the function maturity, but they at that point said, let's keep the asymptote because there was only one year measured that showed this sort of decline. And they didn't know if maybe that was just a weird year, a blob year, or some some sort of year that just caused that to happen once, but most of the years they're actually fully spawning. Um, and so M- Melissa and Claire have added more years to this, um, so from 2014 to up up to now, and found that this is a consistent pattern. And so what we're going to argue is that this ogive here for the functional maturity is the one that should be used. And as you note here, that pushes the 50% maturity L50 up to almost to, to above 41 centimeters, as opposed to what it would be for the biological estimate, which would be 34. <clears throat> In addition to that, you're going to have a decreased um, proportion of mature at the largest sizes as well. So I'm going to stop talking. 
Claire, if you would like to step in and uh, add any more details in particular about the parasitic stuff you, you all are finding, and then we'll open it up to, to discussion. Thanks, Jason. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these figures uh, shown here include 320 samples collected by ODFW port samplers in Oregon uh, from 2014 to 2021. And um, we're going to add an additional 350 samples collected through OSU in the same time period in this maturity analysis. Um, and so that might allow us to investigate interannual variability at length at 50% maturity and just get more precise estimates uh, for L50. And already just with these 320 samples, it's allowed us to estimate functional maturity versus biological maturity. And we've seen a 21.8% increase in that estimate. So I think it's really important to consider that in the uh, stock assessment model. Um, Melissa and I have also noted the presence of parasites and signs of immune response in the ovary samples and found evidence of parasites in almost 10% of the samples. And we would like to investigate this further as there may be implications for reproductive development, fecundity, and possibly survival. Thanks. Thank you so much, Claire. Super, super exciting sort of developments here with just our basic understanding of, of rockfish reproduction, <clears throat> but in particular for black rockfish. I, um, as far as specifying the model, if there are significant year-to-year -year differences, we're going to have to figure out how best to either summarize that in what stock synthesis usually expects, which is one maturity relationship for the whole time period. Um, now, there might be some way that you can um, change it through time or something, but I don't think we would project backwards. I think it's most likely that we would try to summarize over time, unless it's directional or something, some sort of composite maturity uh, relationship and put that in as the singular relationship. Um, and then maybe uh, produce a, a sensitivity versus what if we ignored the functional and used the biological um, side. So those, those are a couple of sensitivities. Um, so let me stop there and let, let me get any feedback. Jason, we have a little discussion in the uh, chat. Yeah. And so um, I guess there's been some discussion uh, as to the nature of the uh, functional maturity as it pertains to skip spawning and juvenile abortive maturation. Um, so this effect in juveniles is spoken to that affects this as well as the uh, kind of older fish as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, John Field points out, um, he asked uh, whether the samples were collected during the reproductive season. And Melissa says, yes, uh, they were collected from October to March. Yep. And that's the and, key for the functional analysis. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and so that, that, that sort of delayed maturation, right? That's the part that affects the L50. And then there's additional to that atresia, <clears throat> other issues that may um, cause an adult who has reproduced before to skip a, a reproductive season. And that's where we see this decrease. Any other comments on this? Again, these are all organ samples. My expectation <clears throat> would be to um, share this maturity curve with the other areas. And Melissa has her hand up. Yeah, hi, Jason. This is Melissa Head. I just wanted to expand a little bit more on some of the parasite uh, analysis me and Claire are working on, just so it's in the back of people's brains as you think about the assessment. Uh, one of the great things that we uncovered, Claire and myself, was that the 
female ovaries um, contained parasites. And just some preliminary analysis showed that that was frequently um, occurring around the size of maturity. And so what was happening was these fish that were supposed to be reaching maturity had parasites and were aborting oocytes. And so this is going to require more in-depth study and we're working towards that, me and Claire are, but there does seem to be um, some concerns regarding their overall fecundity potential, as well as what the parasites are doing to the females if it's causing um, early mortality or simply a reduction in spawning output, as well as a delay in maturity, which is, I think, one of the reasons why this functional maturity thing seems to be common from the, the skip spawning and failures to spawn seems to be more common on an annual basis in black rockfish versus some other species um, where we evaluate functional maturity. This and is that's all. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You finish up. No, that's, I just wanted to share just, just um, a, a glimpse into some of the things we're seeing. And I think it might have some larger implica implications for black rockfish. Um, but we're going to begin working in more detail on trying to understand the parasite relationship with their overall reproductive potential and potentially their mortality. I just want to add to that and just again, th thank you so much. It's, it's just really exciting to see this. I think, I, Claire, I think you reported about a 10% parasitic load. Who knows what, what you'll find as you keep looking at things. Um, but this is definitely a place to plug uh, sampling elsewhere to see if there's any sort of spatial relationship in this parasitic um, uh, load issue or things do things have it more in certain places. Um, and I think I think California is a big unknown right now. And, and so this would I would just put this on the radar of folks who are sampling black rockfish or would be interested in contributing samples to this type of analysis, it would be really interesting to see what, what the parasite action is there. I'm probably going to pass this on. I'm working with folks in Alaska on their black rockfish assessments. They, um, they, they have like 50,000 samples. <laughs> they have so many samples up there. Um, it would be really fascinating to see if they're seeing, they see the same thing about females disappearing and, and all the stuff that we see here. Um, and I think it'd be fascinating to see if they see parasites as well. So this is definitely uh, a starting point that could turn into something really, um, really interesting. Um, and thank you, Melissa and Claire for sharing this. Claire has more detailed parasitic information. If you're really, really interested, um, she has a short PDF she could walk through with you if you wanted to. Um, and she's working on this with um, in her dissertation and should be publishing on it um, hopefully soonish as well. So all sorts of good stuff to look forward to. Any other thoughts? Okay, getting, getting towards the end here. Not without wrinkles, but we're, we're kind of approaching the end and we'll switch over to Washington. <clears throat> So the length weight relationship uh, in 2015, there were about 4,000 unsex samples used to build a length weight relationship. That's going to be revisited. We're going to get more samples and kind of just update that um, and put that in. All right, length at age. So here's our age uh, stuff. We got a lot of good aging work going on. ODF and W is doing some some great stuff, getting a bunch of ages ready. Um, th there's Exchanges, we've already looked at aging air and calculating that. So there's a lot of work on the aging side. You can see that there's quite a bit of samples <clears throat> for both females and males. Uh, the unsect, unsexed size uh, uh, part of it is small. That could be good or bad um, in the sense that if you don't have the small individuals, it can sometimes be hard to get, the, well, it can be hard to get that growth curve. So I'm not making any judgments here, but I'm just saying that the, that most of these things are sexed. And if we look back at the last assessment, this is for all three states, and this is what was used in the 2015. Uh, I just wanted to show you this to highlight um, this disappearing 
female issue. And so here are the females, here are the males, and here are the unsexed. And you can see there's a lot of sampling going on, particularly in Oregon and Washington <clears throat> um, throughout the years. But I mean, you can just see that it just stops and it actually makes it quite difficult to even figure out what the what the L infinity here is in, in, in these particular samples, right? Because you're just not getting anything much above 20 except a few that get out there, maybe 30, 40, something like that. Um, Washington, a bit more, but these are more truncated than what we see with the, the males. <clears throat> we recognize that these are fished populations, and that could be attributing to some of the absence of maybe some of the largest individuals that ever could be seen. Um, but just an interesting um, thing that we see. And like I said, this goes into Alaska, even them with their thousands and thousands of ages uh, see exactly this. Females basically disappear for them after 22. So we're updating our aging conditional ages. We have the hope that we will input this information into the assessment and estimate growth internally. We will also externally estimate growth just so we can see how that is happening and if L infinity is being defined in a reasonable way and so forth. But we do hope that we can integrate the estimation of uncertainty um, in the growth estimates directly in the in the model. But that brings us to our last point here and, and not a not a trivial one, natural mortality. This is one of the bigger things and this is one of the things that Oregon differed in California and Washington last time time in its treatment. Canary brought up the fact that um, they had there in the past had been ramps used to explain the disappearance of females. So let's just start off by first saying males and females um, are going to have different natural mortality rates. Um, I don't see how that's not going to be the case. So we will have sex specific natural mortality. What will that be for the males? I think it's a lot easier to say we are going to assume a constant M and try to estimate that from the data. For the females, we also hope that we can estimate it from the data. And in the Washington and California assessments last time, we were successfully able to do so. And those were actually also assumed to be constant rates, but, but much higher than males. The last Oregon assessment did a ramp from 0.17 to 0.2. And I think the estimated values coming from California and Washington were somewhere around 0.17. So this, this ramping up, is, it's a little bit more, but it's it's not, I think, qualitatively all that much different than what we saw in the other two, even though it does have a ramp. It wasn't like it ramped from 0.1 up to 0.3 across a bunch of different things. So so there's a little bit of a ramp to, to recognize that. The other assessment, in the, the Oregon assessment last time, also had, for one of the fisheries, an age-based uh, dome-shaped selectivity. And this gets into our Hydem or Killam hypotheses, which I describe here. And I think we talked about yesterday, right? You either think that they died, they're not there because they either died or they're not there because they are there, but you can't find them. And so your selectivity needs to be adjusted to say there's cryptic biomass out in the population. We can go back and forth and as as uh, Brian pointed out yesterday, the Canary and Black Rockfish teams have gotten together already a couple times with other interesting folks, interested folks to talk about the pros and cons of each of these. And you just go in circles because ecologically it doesn't feel super great to assume that females just have a time bomb in them that for some reason they die. Um, their 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 longevity is less than half of what a male's is, yet sometimes you see females that get really old. Very bizarre. It also does not feel great to assume that there's a bunch of cryptic biomass that no one can find, everyone's been looking for, and, and no matter where you go, you can't find them. And that this is common across the whole coast. All the places that we've been fishing with all the different gear types, we can never find old females. We can find the big ones. We can get the big ones. 
We can't find the old ones. So I think what we have found in all of this discussion is the most likely path that we're going to take here is that we are going to um, assume that it's mostly due to natural mortality and that the most parsimonious thing is to estimate a constant natural mortality um, that's going to be higher than males. In the many, many uh, looks at this from the last assessment, whether you did a little ramp or just estimated it higher, you didn't get a really big difference. Now, I think Canary mentioned they might do a step from where they go from 1M natural mortality value to a higher one. So that would be different than the possible treatment here. None of this is set in stone, um, but I think I'm most likely leaning towards that. And, and EJ, if you got anything to add on any more thoughts that you've had with California, again, it would be great if we aligned ourselves with a treatment of M in all three areas, because I don't have, for black rockfish, I don't have any reason to believe each of these states have a different biological thing happening to where natural mortality should be treated differently in the three different areas. So I'll stop there and I'll get some feedback. Well, Jason, just to respond, um, I, I do agree with you. Yeah, I, I think that we should have a, a consistent approach. Um, and I, I'm leaning towards what you're talking about too. And due to the sort of how, how uncomfortable it is for a lot of these, for, for either scenario, I think the one thing that is worth exploring is uh, sort of sensitivities to the alternative hypotheses, just so we understand how much of a the difference there is between them um, and the and potential impacts for management. Uh, but I, I think that your approach just with sex specific constant M is probably the direction we're going to start with as well. Great. Yeah. And, and so I think that leads naturally to my last thing to say here um, for Oregon is, is just kind of summarize where are the places where we think we're going to spend a lot of time exploring uncertainty because we pick a reference model that we don't believe is perfectly right. And therefore, we want to uh, run these sensitivity models, these alternative hypotheses to see how much of a difference the things we care about to report to managers change. And EJ is right on is that we're going to probably spend a, a fair bit of time exploring natural mortality and maybe even its interaction with selectivity a little bit. And he's had some ideas about how to do that. So that's one area I want to highlight. I've already highlighted the fact that we'll explore a little bit with our maturity and fecundity relationship, right? Um, the age of growth stuff, we'll see how those come out, but that could be another source of exploration. Um, we talked about the other really big thing being the removal data and the assumptions there. And then lastly, um, the other very typical thing we do is that we explore the different data types and their influences on the ultimate reference model and putting it, taking in weightings, all this, the weighting treatments of model of the data. So how we weight the weights, the ages, the indices, and then whether we even put some of these in or out of the model, those are gonna be also types of sensitivities we will provide to show um, the contributions of different data types and how they affect the model. So I'll stop there. I think we'll go through Washington, given that we've covered a lot of common issues with some of the assessments here with Oregon. I think we'll be able to go through the next two areas probably a bit quicker. But let me stop for a moment and see how people are doing. No hands up. Okay. My, my intent is to get, roll right over to Washington and definitely be done with Washington by 11 o'clock to give EJ a full hour for California if he needs it. Okay. I was just had my one question is, is there a, a break plan during this meeting and when would that occur? Yeah, I was just gonna interject that. Thank you, EJ. Um, yeah, I think uh, before we step into Washington, perhaps we should take a a uh, five minute break, just a health break, and uh, come on back at, uh, well, we'll give it till 1025. We'll give it nine minutes just in case. So 
um, if that works for folks. And then we'll come back around and uh, to Washington and California. I don't think that'll leave us short. All right, so 1025. Jason Cope is going to be the presenter for this one, I assume. I am. Yeah. Want to point out. All right. Yeah. My um, other members of the stat team, Teresa, Lisa, Kristen, Corey, all WDFW um, staff, wonderful folks to work with. Grateful to have them on here. They put a lot of work into compiling things that we need to um, share with you today. And so let me walk through that. Again, there'll be a lot of common issues from Oregon, so we'll probably step through this a bit um, quicker. So let's go for it. Here is a summary of what happened last time. Here is the relative abundance, or what we call our stock status, um, time series from last assessment. You can see much more uncertainty, um, putting the population in around um, the target. Here was a spawning output. Now, interestingly enough, I think last assessment, it actually triggered <clears throat> uh, the discussion of, of, of the need to, to drop the catch limits, even though it's at the target. And we need to remind ourselves that just because you might be at the target doesn't mean whatever you've been catching is sustainable because the scale of the population might put you in a different place that says your sustainable catch is actually lower. So that was a bit of a complication, I think, last time um, dealing with that. <clears throat> and we've already discussed the fact that the scale of the population is um, probably a lot less certain than this for the simple fact that the historical catch is not really well known. And so this is something that we'll be talking about. But that's from last assessment. This is what we saw. Um, the bridge model, again, you can see that once we go from the um, old model to the new model and fixing it, pretty much the same thing. If you let it estimate, it gets you something a little bit different. And that's on the absolute scale. And here's on the relative scale of the stock status. Um, so a little bit, little bit more of a difference than what you see with the Oregon. Now, the, again, the Oregon model was a lot more constrained. This model is estimating recruitments. It's doing a lot more. Um, so it's not that big of a surprise to see the estimation phase being a bit different, a bit more different. So anyway, nothing here is raising red flags to say we can't use the new synthesis. All right, unresolved questions from last time, basically the same as we had before. I've mentioned the stock structure um, arguments already, same as we had for Oregon, as that was a synoptic discussion of all areas. Um, and let me just remind folks that, again, these are online. These are shareable um, presentations. And for folks that weren't here, or if there's anyone, stakeholders, anyone that you think might benefit from looking at this and, and then contacting any of the members of the stat team afterwards, please share these links. These links are going to still be up um, and they're welcome to look through and reach out. And we, this isn't the only place to give us some input though, as we keep moving forward, we're going to start making some hard decisions because we have to move forward. So sooner than later, getting input from folks is um, would be better, but please share this stuff with with folks that may not have been able to make it here. Um, all right, fleet structure, same as last time. There is a trawl fishery, which we'll see here at the, uh, is again, basically just a historical thing that goes away, but it has some significant 
contributions to removals. Then there in the 80s, there's this jig fishery that was a commercial fishery. So different than the trawl, and it kind of had its heyday in the 80s and then kind of went away. So the commercials, all the commercial stuff was stopped by the state um, in the late 90s anyway. So you don't see any of that stuff in the last 20 years. And again, this is a bit, this is mostly a recreational or sport fishery. So same same fleet structure as last time. Didn't see any reason to um, change that. Here are the um, commercial landings and discards. And at this point, they, these are historical fisheries. There's nothing else going on. This is what we showed from the last assessment. <clears throat> we are talking as a stat about revisiting some of this stuff. In particular, you see this enormous amount of removals assumed from the trawl fishery. And in particular, 1945, there's just this immense um record of black rockfish but it's not really a record right it's a translation of an unfished or unknown rockfish applied to some species comp that came from an assumption of something from different years and then the 3a assignment 98.6 percent of it going to washington right there's all of these things that are assumed to get this value <clears throat> and i think we really want to revisit whether this large removal history is true. Um, and that is going to play through to the scale of the population. Um, and to be honest, this may think that the population was a bit bigger than it was, but um, we'll see. So we're gonna revisit that, but it's all historical. There's really nothing else going on. Um, so we either gonna use this one or come up with this alternative one and we'll run this as a sensitivity at minimum. <clears throat> In addition to what we outlined with Oregon, there are also some PACFIN specific um, issues. And I think mostly for the from the 80s to the 90s, that's where the action is going to be, right? Because after this, it doesn't matter. So in this area right here, there is also some discussion about um, catch area codes and things that, that are going to need to be looked into and sorted out. So there's a bit more work to be done figuring out what in the world the commercial catch history is. Again, the main source of removals are recreational landings. <clears throat> and you can see here that um, we have the old version from the assessment and the new one. And there's, even though there were some changes in the assumption of discards and, and, and all that, we did a, we did a, um, a thorough catch reconstruction last assessment and we don't see see the need to revise that in any way other than we added some new years that would have redefined the assumption of discards but it only it what the good news is that even though it added we used 13 years last time to to determine this discard <clears throat> um, estimation backwards it added a, eight, eight more years so not quite doubled the number, but but a, certainly a lot more years, didn't really change the relationship much. So this relationship that we were getting uh, from from what was caught to what was actually discarded dead um, was pretty much re retained, and so that felt good. wasn't much need to adjust this all that much, and um, going forward, this is the new reported uh, recreational catch trend. So that's what we have for catches. And don't really have any items for discussion that we thought um, to bring forward to you regarding this catch history. <clears throat> I'm going to keep moving. Speak up um, if if you would like. Indices of abundance. We there's some new things going on here <clears throat> to point your attention to. One, maybe I'll just jump down. Fishery dependent recreational dock side index. Uh, we used this last time. We're just going to extend this. So there's that. <laughs> There's this historical tag release um, <clears throat> series that was also used last time and is going to have an extension of years. There is this new nearshore coastal rod and reel survey, and it's only um, like four years long, but it is a coast-wide, Washington coast-wide survey. 
there is the possibility of actually linking this because these two things fish very similarly to <clears throat> the rec the sport fishery. But we do have length comps for these, and we're going to probably estimate their own the own select the selectivities specific to these based on the lengths that were sampled here. But we expect it not to be super different from the recreational fishery. So these are related to the recreational fishery, but they are truly fishery independent surveys. These two surveys share one small marine area. And so there is the possibility of basically rolling this one into the end of the time series here if we were willing to give up the coastwide look and just isolate the data from this into marine area two. You could then have a continuous time series. So we are discussing whether we should do that or not. Um, this stuff was presented to Groundfish Subcommittee last September, I believe. So some of you may have already seen us talk about the specifics of this data. <clears throat> if there is any recommendation on reducing the information content, but extending it four years for here versus having these be separate, this would be a great time to, to share that or send us an email and let us know. The last survey, this is a totally brand new thing for consideration. Northwest Fishery Science Center um, has in the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary been doing, conducting scuba surveys in the near shore. And they have a pretty broad, uh, these 10 sites are actually pretty spatially broad. And these provide measures of two things. One, young of the year recruitment index, not unlike maybe that Smurfs thing that we're considering for Oregon. And then they also are counting adult relative abundance. Uh, you can click here on this little click thing here to get a more uh, a fuller understanding of what is actually being done and how things are being calculated. And you can actually look at the trends if you would like to. This is. Um, this is a brand new thing. This is more of something we want to consider looking in and seeing how consistent it is with these other data sources. I doubt we would ever weight this survey over the information coming from here. So it's mostly um, seeing whether this is giving a sim similar trend to some of these other things and the possibility of having maybe a recruitment index that's consistent with what we might be picking up in our length comps could be exciting. So I think it's well worth um, considering this survey. And yes, it is scuba um, and it's, it's a different sampling uh, style than some of these other things, but it's well worth, I think, considering. So that's exciting. And I think um, um, folks, um, Oli Shelton is the one that worked this up for us and uh, his colleagues very generous in doing that and being excited to see if their fair science, which they have other publications that this work is being used for, if that science can be rolled into an assessment, it would be great. So we'll see. Okay. I think I highlighted the issues for discussion about the, um, the tag release and the near shore survey maybe being combined. <clears throat> um, Again, bag limits changing over time, working that into the standardization process and um, making sure that that is recognized is something we will consider doing. And I've always already mentioned about the standardization and, and process in general. We're going to figure out how best to all of us kind of do the, a similar sort of analysis on this <clears throat> across the three states. Okay, any, any discussion on indices? We march along to the compositional data again, um, just showing you sample sizes and letting you uh, realize that for the commercial, most of those samples, not huge amounts of samples, but they are uh, back in the 80s and 90s, and they were used to 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 determine the selectivity of those gears from the last assessment, and they are and that's why they are treated differently. So we'll continue to do that. You can also see um, more recently 
um, how the sport fishery has been being sampled um, and the fact that over the last 15 years, it has been the last few years, um, again, COVID uh, related issues there. Um, so we might be a little little weaker than than normal with some of the signaling, but we also know that our length comps in the most recent years aren't typically the best things to inform us of things like recruitment and the fact that we are most likely going to be using um, uh, asymptotic selectivity curves for for this sport fishery, and I don't know if we're going to have any sort of need for a, a block. If so, we can put it in, but we'll probably have not a block every single year. So the fact that we are low on samples here, while not great, I think we'll still be able to do what we need to for the assessment to characterize the selectivity of the survey and still capture some information on um, important recruitment events, which we did estimate in the last assessment. And I anticipate we will estimate recruitments again for this one. Uh, the commercial length comps, this is just a representation from the last assessment because we're using the exact same data. There's nothing changed from that. So um, unless unless we uncover something in PACFIN that needs to be changed, uh, this is basically what we're going to have. Um, and you can kind of see that they're just kind of all over the place. Big fishery portion of the commercial. Maybe, maybe some... Uh, recruitment signals there, maybe. <clears throat> Here are the recreational length comps. This is showing you what they look like um, for males and females. So we have our um, females here in the blue, males in the green. You can see that going through time. This is um, time series. So we started this way and we snake through here and and again you can see that the 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 females in the growth curve tend to be a little bit bigger than the males but you're not given the really distinct truncation in age that we seem to be seeing with females you're not seeing the fact that we're just missing a bunch of old females sorry not old big there the bigger females are showing up um <clears throat> All right, and if we put that all into aggregate, we can see the females being at a little slightly bigger than males, and that the unknown sex <clears throat> is really not much different than the, those two. And so that un that unknown sex part, right? Um, you may worry, oh no, what what's that going to be? Is that going to mess up our um, our figuring out what's going on. You can see that the, the there isn't a huge difference in the growth of the males and the females here. And when you break out the actual percentage of sex and unsexed, the unsexed being these blue squares, you can see that mostly being very low for a lot of years. And it, it kind of goes up some years. It's It's dominant, but it's kind of all over the place. But there seems to be a lot of male and female sexed compared to uh, more, more of the sex than the unsexed in many of the years, though there are a few years where that um, that is going to have to be sorted out by the model. And that's a common thing that happens in our models. Okay, survey length comps. We mentioned that those can be used to to identify the selectivity. And you can see for that, that um, the um, tagging one, we got a fair bit of samples, quite a bit. And then for the near shore, that four year one that could get rolled into here, there's still a fair bit of samples for that if it did have to be by itself. Uh, but again, we anticipate that these selectivity curves are probably not gonna be too unlike the recreational fishery, which I think we mirrored this to last time. So this time we might estimate it itself, but probably pretty similar. All right, length comps, you see that we have a, quite a bit of compositional data for each of the fisheries and should be able to get selectivities for them. Any questions on that? All right, well, we will finish here um, with just some 
treatments of biology, very, very important. Maturity and fecundity, we already mentioned. We're going to borrow the organ maturity analysis for Washington. I mentioned, I didn't mention before, but fecundity at length, <clears throat> this is an important consideration for rockfishes in general. And EJ did the did the the pioneering work on this for our rockfish is to show that that a, an assumption of proportionality between weight and fecundity isn't necessarily a good one for a rockfish. And he came up with relationships for a lot of rockfish, including Sebastes melanops. We will use his formulation um, and turn it into a stock synthesis formulation for all of these assessments. So that'll be shared. Length rate relationship is state specific. Here are the male and female ones um, that we have that we'll use for the um, Washington model. And those are the equations. And you can see that there really isn't much of a difference between males and females here, which is good to know since the organ stuff before was unsexed and we kind of had to share share between the two. So not a big difference. And looking at the difference between these updated weight length relationships from the past assessment, very, very small differences, nothing significant. So I don't know what's going on with these little nasty ones right here, but I don't think they have much of a, much of a say in the overall sampling density here. Uh, so I think we have a good length weight relationship to use. Here are the um, age at lengths that are available. Um, and this is a combined plot that shows you, and you can basically, I showed you that one last time that showed all the states. This is a zoom in for Washington and putting the males and females on top um, of each other. You can kind of see where females maybe get a little bit bigger and you can really see that deterioration of samples um, for the older males. But every once in a while you get a female that kind of gets out here into thirties and forties. So they aren't all just dropping off in their 20s, but it certainly seems like more of them are than males. All right, and then that brings us back to natural mortality. One thing I don't think I mentioned is that um, I'll go to and use the natural mortality tool to help develop the priors for the estimation that we hope to eventually do within the model for males and females separately. So I think that's it. That covers all of the details that we wanted to bring forward to you today. Let me invite any of the stat team members. Did I miss anything that you'd like to go back and make any more specific comments on? Correct me if I said anything wrong and then open it up to any other general questions or ideas. I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, nothing new in the chat. Okay. I just stopped sharing my screen and I'm happy to turn time back over to you, Dr. Budrick, or to EJ, whomever's um, taking the next step forward. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we will go ahead and start to transition over to the California presentation. See as there's no questions on Washington, if by the end of our uh, meeting today, there's something that comes up for Washington and somebody wants to digress, uh, that's, that's totally fine. For right now, we'll go ahead and move on to the California presentation. EJ Dick, Southwest Fishery Science Center. Thanks, John. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen here and hopefully it will be, um, easy enough to make it work here. Let's see. Um, okay, can you see the title slide? Yes. Great. Okay, so first off, I just wanna thank uh, my other team members. Um, Tanya Rogers is here at the Fisheries Ecology Division in Santa Cruz. Uh, she is running one of our seminar series and that happens to fall at this time, so she can't attend, unfortunately, today. Um, Nick Grunlow is a PhD candidate at UCSC, um, has worked with us for several years on topics related to stock assessment, and Julia Coates is with the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife's Marine Region, and is going to be a 
very uh, helpful contact and uh, for, for all the California data sources and uh, interpretation. So um, first, thanks to them. And then I'll just to remind everyone, please feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, and I've also included my email on the contact uh, or on the title page. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to email me. I'm particularly interested in input from uh, industry. Um, and, and of course, recreational angler, anglers, just uh, earlier questions, as Jason said, are, are the most helpful because we'll have time to look into them. Um, and let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. So just to recap where we were with the 2015 assessment, and, and luckily we have Jason here. So Jason, please chime in if I mischaracterize anything. Um, the big picture was that uh, spawning output in the terminal year was between the management target and the overfish threshold, and the trend was increasing. Um, and you know, you can see that given the uncertainty bounds, that's just sort of the most likely outcome. Although, of course, we don't really know exactly where we are. Um, and that recent fishing intensity has been coming down um, over the past couple of decades and is approaching and are somewhere near target levels. Um, just a quick recap of it. Um, as Jason mentioned, we have state specific assessments this time, just like we did last time. For California, that met between the US Mexico border and, Cal and the California Oregon border. Um, it was done in stock synthesis with um, a fishing fleet structure that had three commercial fisheries trawl, and then the non trawl portion was divided up into uh, fish landed dead and fish landed alive. And recreational fisheries were combined into a single fleet. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. I may, I may revisit that assumption just because of some of the California specific uh, size composition data. Um, for the fishery dependent, there were only fishery dependent surveys in, in the uh, assessment. Um, two of them were onboard observer CPFV surveys that were uh, run at different times. And so they were kept separate, had slightly different uh, protocols. Um, and so that was 88 to 99, and then from 2000 to 2014. And then the third survey was based on the MRFs uh, recreational sampling design, and that was all dockside catch rate information from 1980 to 2003. Um, the length and age composition data came from a variety of commercial recreational research sources and uh, natural mortality, as Jason has mentioned, um, was higher, assumed to be higher for females than it was for males to explain uh, the lack of females in the data. And growth was also uh, sexually dimorphic. And lastly, uh, you know, important consideration for all of these assessments is the stock recruitment relationship, and it was Beverton Holt and had a fixed steepness parameter, which largely uh, influences uh, productivity. Coming out of that assessment, some of the major remaining uncertainties and research recommendations were um, having to do, as Jason mentioned, with this high to killum hypothesis, you know, wrapped up into assumptions about selectivity and natural mortality. Um, there has been a, more research into trying to find those females, and I think there is a report pending from ODFW uh, with a lot more details. Um, and we're going to be considering those alternative hypotheses, hypotheses that we were talking about before with Jason about um, different forms for natural mortality um, and its relationship to the assumptions about selectivity, just to understand what the implications are so we can communicate that to the managers. Um, then in terms of uh, productivity, we know we're, I don't have any um, information at this point as to where that's gonna lead because you know, we are gonna be including a few new data sources and additional data from sources that appeared in the last assessment, so I don't exactly know where that's going to end up at this point. It's, we're all just in the data exploration stage. Um, and like I said, we're going to be looking at a slightly different fleet structure for the recreational fleet. Um, so there has been, uh, there was a request for a fishery independent nearshore survey 
and the California Cooperative Fisheries Research Program, I believe I'm getting that acronym right, um, has recently expanded to include uh, a much larger area within the state. It used to be mainly Central California. And so we're gonna be exploring those data. Um, they were looked at in the previous assessment, but I think the, the time series was relatively short. And um, so we're, we're just gonna revisit it. Um, and then we're going to look at new ways to uh, look at the fishery dependent indices and also a private rental fleet index. And then um, lastly, explore some of the concerns around uncertainty and historical landings that were brought up. So for stock structure, um, like I said, we're sticking with state specific models um, and we are very likely going to have a single area model for all of California. I, I, there, there are complications with using uh, models that have multiple areas in them, and I don't see a need to break up California into multiple models. That would be excessive, I think, um, since most of the catches are in the north. Um, we're going to be looking at data for spatial differences in growth, exploitation history, and catch rates, just trying to understand uh, spatial differences and, and the structure a little bit better. And um, also in terms of movement, the, the studies that I've found and that I'm aware of have typically found relatively limited movement for most individuals. Um, and of course there are occasional exceptions to that, um, but we are looking into some results from recent studies that have found uh, large movements and uh, some of those seem to be directional you know, moving from south to north, which is relevant um, for one of, the, one of the pieces of data that I'll show later. Um, so before I get into figures, um, just a quick overview of the landings for the recreational uh, fisheries. We're starting in 1928, um, again, using the Ralston et al. reconstruction. Uh, we're gonna have it split into uh, skiff and, or, yeah, basically CPFV and private boats. Um, and then similar uh, fleets from 1981 to 2003 through the MRFs era and, you know, interpolating missing years. And um, MRFs was not as spatially resolved as the current sampling program. It basically just created estimates for the area north of Point Conception and the area south of Point Conception. So um, we may partition that northern area using data from a study it published in 1993 that looked at catch estimates by um, not exactly county but in, in the northern area broken up into five se sections and then from 2004 to present we have the surfs uh, program data which is uh, you know much more data rich and allows us to look at things uh, in higher resolution so for commercial um, probably be starting around the turn of the last century with a ramp up to wherever the first catch reconstruction starts. Um, that California catch reconstruction completed by Ralston et al. breaks the commercial catch up into trawl and non-trawl fisheries. Um, and then to bridge the gap between that and the pack fin era, which starts in 1981, we have um, landing receipts that were recovered by the Southwest Fishery Science Center and then species comps from the earliest available samples were applied to those and we just refer to those to those as the ratio estimates so that'll that spans 1969 to 1980 for California and again I can't see any hands so John uh Butterick, if you wouldn't mind uh, letting me know if any, if any questions do pop up I'd appreciate it sure none yet um so quick overview of the recreational catch. On the left, we have a map showing the uh, surfs districts, uh, one through six from south to north. And then I've uh, summed the catch by district uh, in metric tons over this time period, 2005 to 2022. These are data from RecFin. So you can see that you know most of the, it definitely skews north and with the uh, Redwood district having the largest amount of catch. Um, although the Bay Area does have a decent amount um, of removals as well. For the, th this plot basically shows each of those districts now with the catches uh, 
over time. So the vertical axis is again, metric tons of recreational catch uh, total mortality and districts one and two are basically down on the zero line. There's I think over the entire time span, less than two metric tons caught. Um, and then you can see basically um, that there are spikes in landings over time. Um, some of these do sync up uh, with recruitment events that were estimated in the last model. Um, and uh, as I'll show later with uh, changes in average length, um, which suggests that they may be real, the absolute magnitude of them may you know, be uh, up for debate a bit. There's uncertainty in each of these estimates. But um, that's that's the general pattern uh, over time for each district. And this is um, something that has led me to um, start to consider alternative fleet structures for the model. Um, when I was looking at mean length um, by SURF's district, um, I noticed that you know, you have a larger mean length. Essentially what we have here is mean length on the vertical axis. Um, the Redwood area, Surf District 6 is in blue. Um, the Wine District is in orange and then Bay Area and Central are down here. And it's it's consistent over time for, for at least most of these. Um, and that lined up with an observation from a publication by Karpov et al in 1995 where they defined northern and central here as um, those are subdivisions of the area north of Point Conception, and their north and central areas break basically at the northern border of Santa Cruz County, so just below the Bay Area. Um, and they they also found that basically there were not a lot of large fish in the southern part of the range. And that seems to be consistent based on the surf's data. So it's another wrinkle in the Hydem or Killam debate here, because unlike Hydem or Killam, uh, in, in the other states where you're still seeing the large females, even though they're young, um, in the southern part of the California range, which includes the Bay Area here, you're also not seeing large fish, um, which is something that I want to explore. And one of the ways I'd like to do that is to define spatial area, spatially explicit fleets um, in the in the model. So that's essentially a what we call fleets as areas approach, and it would involve partitioning the catch into a northern fleet for districts five and six, and a central fleet for districts three and four. And it would probably that central fleet would probably wrap in anything in the Southern California area, which is minor, um, wouldn't change much. And then that allows us to look at uh, area specific selectivity, even though the model does assume that it's one mixed population. Um, so, you know, what exactly is driving this? I'm not sure. And I would love input from anyone who has thoughts or uh, especially if you have data <laughs> um, that could help inform this, that would be great. Um, and then in addition to that spatial segregation, uh, of the recreational catch, we will probably also separate out the CPFV catch from the private boats, um, in part because we're gonna be looking at a private boat specific index, which I'll talk about later. So are there any questions at this point about that fleet structure and the data? All right. Um, so moving on to some looks at the commercial catch, this is a uh, recent data um, taken from both PACFIN and CALCOM. Um, CALCOM provides PACFIN with species composition estimates, which are then applied to fish tickets, and that, that's what gives the catch estimates. Um, and there, there are no major differences between the two sources. Um, the last assessment did look at some of the anomalies in the commercial catch. And for example, in the trawl landings, uh, the figure on the left, there were some spikes in the early 80s. And those numbers were adjusted based on conversations with uh, Fish and Wildlife staff. Um, we'll probably retain those adjusted estimates, but I think it's something that we'll have to 
talk to uh, current staff and Julia and, and see, see just to make sure that we're all on the same page about what was done and uh, whether or not that still makes sense given any new information. Um, we'll probably retain the assumption that the live and dead hook and line fisheries are different fleets um, just due to the size composition differences, just like was done in the 2015 assessment. Um, I looked at uh, the um, net fishery um, just out of habit because I've worked with California data a lot. It's a very small fraction of the total. And what we'll probably do is just look at its size distribution and lump it with whatever fleet has the most similar um, composition data. And similarly for any of the other minor gears, you know, fish pots and anything else like that that might have brought in a few fish. Um, and then out of curiosity, I uh, was plotting the commercial mean lengths just to see if that pattern that showed up in the recreational fishery um, was consistent, and it is. Um, so what you can see here is mean length over time um, from commercial samples. And I, I restricted it to, well, this is sexes combined, so it's a bit of an aggregate, but, um, and, and only those years uh, that had at least 20 samples. Um, but you can see that there are larger fish in the northern port complexes. And then you know, the brackets at the bottom there show the San Francisco Monterey and Morro Bay samples. There, there wasn't a lot um, that had high sample sizes in that area. Um, however, I think it probably doesn't, it isn't really as critical in this case to set up area specific fleets for the commercial um, catches because essentially the vast majority, unlike the recreational catch, which had, which had a significant amount of catch in the Bay Area, um, looking at recent landings here, you know, you have a you have a little bit um, coming into the Bay Area, but compared to what's coming in um, from Crescent City, you know, through um, Bodega and whatnot. I mean, that that's just Unfortunately, these are not ordered spatially like I had in the other plot. They're alphabetical, so I apologize for that. But um, you can see that it's it, it, so. Even if we did do that, it probably wouldn't matter that much um, at all. Um, so I think it'd probably just be simpler to keep the commercial fleets as one. Um, so discard is really something we still need to look at. Um, uh, they'll be, we'll put in a request to the WICOP group uh, for commercial discard estimates. Um, my understanding is that rec fins, recreational discards are included in the total mortality estimates. So we'll just be using those um, as is without adjustment for additional discard. Um, I, I am curious, Jason, because you mentioned something about shore modes and discard estimates. I didn't know if that was an exception or um, we, maybe we can talk about that offline. Um, and then one other piece of information that might be of use here is the size compositions from the onboard CPFV samplers. They they get size compositions of the discarded catch. So um, there are different ways to think about that in the modeling framework. Um, one way we've done it in the past is to actually have the discards as a separate recreational fleet, which would then have a smaller size composition. So the, those, uh, the mortality due to discard would have a, a different size composition from the mortality of the retained fish. Um, but there, there are other ways to approach that. And I think it, that might actually be a discussion for all the stats so we can come up with a, a similar approach. Um, and then some uh, fish that are, reported by anglers are not identified to species and they're just lumped into the rockfish genus category in the recreational catch. Um, they're not currently included in the mortality estimates for individual species. Um, and I think it's probably worth a conversation to talk about that um, just so that we can not have, just to determine the magnitude of the potential difference. And I think it's gonna differ by area, you know, um, it's going to be it, it, potentially by year. Um, there's there's a lot of different factors, and I'm sure that the Fish and Wildlife staff can help guide us here. Um, but uh, the concern there is that if you underestimate total mortality, 
that can result in a lower estimate of biomass and yield in the model. And so I think the, we can, hopefully it's not a big issue, um, but it's worth a check, I think, um, to make sure that we're not uh, underestimating the total mortality. Um, Going into age data, um, the 2015 assessment had uh, four sources listed here, and uh, we're looking into um, over 2,000, uh, potentially 2,500 new ages for this assessment. Um, I've shown sort of a prioritized list we have right now, um, and the ones in yellow, if you look at the cumulative uh, column on the right basically add up to around that 2400 when you include 10 percent for double reads and understanding age error um, so this is the current plan to supplement what was used in the 2015 assessment and i am hoping that we will be able to tag on those ccfrp otoliths um, just because those are one of the better sources we have for the southern area and one hypothesis about the smaller fish in the south is that growth could be different in that area. Um, and so having uh, additional ages from that um, southern part of the range would help us uh, understand whether or not that's the case. Um, let's see here. For indices of abundance, uh, like I mentioned before, there were three in the 2015 assessment. Um, several other ones were explored in that assessment, but weren't ultimately included since um, since we have more data now, um, I'm going to be revisiting some of those. And uh, as I mentioned, we want to look at the private rental boat index uh, specifically because CPFB sample sizes tend to decrease in the north relative to the southern parts of the state. And the private rental boat index usually has pretty good sample sizes, uh, even up into the northern counties. So that's uh, one new, new index that we're going to explore. Um, we're also going to look at revising the onboard CPFB indices to um, include information about habitat. That's something that we've been working on here at the Fisheries Ecology Division um, with Melissa Monk and Becky Miller, and um, trying to see if that makes any differences. Essentially what it's doing is it's taking the catch rate data and making the assumption that that's proportional to local densities, and then that multiplied by the amount of habitat available, you can sum it all up and come up with um, an index that is more representative or you know, habitat weighted essentially across the range of the index. Um, we're going to revisit uh, the pelagic juvenile rockfish index. Uh, black rockfish are not incredibly common in that index, but it is also possible that due to the fact that a lot of the different species co-vary in their patterns over time that we could use a proxy. Um, so we're exploring that possibility. Um, also looking into uh, recruitment indices from the dive surveys, just like uh, Jason was mentioning for Washington. Um, that's both PISCO and uh, some surveys that are done here at the Fisheries Ecology Division uh, with Tom Leidig. And then, and lastly, as I mentioned before, the CCFRP uh, data, because that, that will be not only potentially um, information about trends, but also size composition, and that could also inform recruitment. And so this is the last slide I think I have, um, just overview of biology. Um, we are going to be looking at length at age as the ages come in from the lab. Um, so that's going to be something that just trickles in over time uh, while we're preparing. Uh, but hopefully, you know, looking at it again by sex, by area to understand those differences in, in mean size and time block. Um, some of this was looked at in the 2015 assessment, but given all of the new samples that we have, we wanted to look at it one more time. Um, and we're going to inform the priors for natural mortality using uh, maximum observed age. And, and I think we'll also look at the uh, natural mortality tool that Jason has provided links for. And then um, I, there, to my knowledge, there are not a lot of samples uh, for maturity at length from California. So it's very likely that we're going to be borrowing um, from the Oregon study for that. But um, 
we're looking for any and all sources of information on that to see if we can get something that's uh, specific to this area. And as Jason mentioned, we'll be using fecundity uh, at length from the meta-analysis in 2017, and then looking at weight length relationships by area and sex, just to see if there are any important differences. And that is it for California. Um, I haven't heard any questions, but I'd like to open it up. I I'm very curious to hear if anyone has any thoughts, particularly on the lack of large fish in the South. It's a mystery, I suppose. <laughs> Not seeing any hands coming up just yet. Um, I did have one question for you just on the spatial range of the sampling for the Southwest Fishery Science Center uh, dive surveys. Right. Um, those are primarily, um, Men I think it's Mendocino and then Monterey. So it's more, um, yeah. Northern but, I mean, the range yeah. only goes North down to conception, North. so, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it definitely, exactly. I mean, but it's something we want to look at, and we're just trying to see if, if there are any um, similarities between the uh, the pelagic juvenile survey and the scuba surveys. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, wait. Um, sorry? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just saying these. You know, these these are all data sources that we're exploring at this point. We can't really say exactly what's going to end up in the assessment. Okay. Yeah, kind of interested for other species for the ROV complement for near to shore from the uh, dive survey. So anyway, um, I might look into that for my own interests. But yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Wayne Katow has his hand up. Hi. I just got a quick question. I quite a few times I'm hearing that you're missing the data for the rec sector and you need more information on on size, length, maturity, and everything else. How can we get more of the rec sector involved in providing that data? Or is that something that we should be looking to put um, an EFP together or a, a scientific collection program together? Or how do we help get this missing data to you? so that you can be more accurate in the analysis going forward? Well, I mean, there are some programs that are spinning up right now that are aiming to do that. Um, one of the larger data gaps in California in particular has been ages from the recreational sector. So that would involve pulling otoliths. Um, and I know that there are efforts underway now to collect those um, oftentimes from carcasses that have been filleted. Um, that's a relatively new program. Um, ideally, you know, if th this is a, a good a part of this is, is a collaboration with Fish and Wildlife and how we can arrange things. So I think um, also Melissa Monk at our laboratory is uh, spinning up biological data collection uh, surveys. Um, and so we, we have some of those already um, operating and uh, trying to go out and, and, and collect that type of information. That's not specifically from the recreational sector um, per se, um, but a lot of it is in collaboration with uh, rec operators. So um, I think it might be something to talk about. If, if you want to contact me, I could give you more information about exactly what, what we're doing. And, and uh, I think that the department could also chime in on that and look for opportunities, um, you know, any, anything else that we can do, that would be great. But there are, there are some things in place right now. Um, it's just a matter of, I think, we're, we're trying to resolve that is the short answer. <laughs> yeah, and we're trying to be more proactive and trying to make sure that, that you guys have the data necessary for proper analysis. We know these things take time, take money, take resources, but we all need to work towards that, I think. We, we I don't know. From the rec side, we just don't know what's missing. That's been the problem, and but we're trying right. to be a more take a more proactive stance in this whole thing. 
So if we know, like we're doing with the coppers and the, and the quill back, if we need to start talking to the guys to deliver length data and, and the carcasses and all that, then we can put a campaign together. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, length information is pretty good under the surf sampling program. Um, I think uh, biologic, like ages, um, maturity, fecundity, that type of stuff, um, those are things where, collecting. of course, it's not just collecting the sample, too. You have to do the analysis as well. So, and, you know, storing samples, all that kind of stuff. So it definitely does, uh, coordination is a great idea between between the rec uh, folks and, and state and federal agencies, I, I agree. So if you please send me an email and I can try to put you in touch with the folks who are already working on some of those programs and maybe we can um, just keep pushing that along. Melissa Monk at our lab has been highly involved in that and um, I think she could also give you a lot more information. Okay, and I, I Melissa has my contact info, so I'm sure we're talking. Oh, great. Thanks. Andre Klein might have something to say about this as well. Yeah, hi, thanks, John. Uh, just a little bit of background, expand on what EJ had mentioned from CDFW's perspective. We are uh, collecting odorless and stacks from whole fish now from the recreational fishery, largely from the PR component, but also the uh, PC component as well. So Wayne, I've I've got your contact info. I can uh, reach out to you and we can discuss maybe how to spread the word and, and get more of those samples. Okay, look forward to it, Andre. Thanks, Andre. I guess um, <clears throat> in the chat, we had some discussion of uh, some of these potential hypotheses as to why, you know, you might be seeing smaller fish uh, to the south in California. I think um, you know, Dave Sampson brought up one that is, um, you know, the fish might move north as they get older. It's being a potential hypothesis, having, you know, uh, spawning stock to the north and larval production and movement of those larvae south. And then as adults, they're moving as they grow out further to the north. It's been observed in some of their spasties, but um, anyway, I guess, you know, you've got the one, that potential hypothesis, the differences in growth, and then potential just differences in uh, kind of fishing mortality and them potentially just being smaller fish left. Um, so that's kind of three hypotheses potentially, I guess. Were there, were there others that folks can conceive of as to why there's smaller fish to the south? When you say three, John, are you talking about movement, death, or unavailability to the, or lack of availability? No, more of growth, I guess, for the third one is what I was thinking, but I guess you could add a fourth for lack of availability in the south, although we've been open to 40 fathoms in uh, the central management area and, and, you know, the vast majority of black rockfish are observed within that depth. But um, there, there's the oddball circumstances that you see of those larger individuals 500 miles offshore that are kind of mind boggling. But um, <laughs> what you do with that or what further evidence there might be is a consideration. I mean, we can look at a little bit of the, you know, length with depth from the ROV survey data for what data we have for black rockfish to see if there's, um, you know, trends with latitude, um, et cetera, um, with the length by depth, um, the two regions that might be somewhat interesting, but yeah, as to what you do with those fish that might be elsewhere, hypothetically, um, is, is there any equivalent evidence, you know, to what's been seen off Oregon, as far as those fish far offshore, or any other indications that those fish might be otherwise absent as a fourth kind of hypothesis? Yeah, and, and I think um, it, it seems like if, if we can define the fleets spatially, even if we have a single area model, um, that assuming like a domed selectivity for the south would in a way account for, you know, assuming that those fish didn't move into Oregon, <laughs> um, if they just go up to Northern California, it, that would, in, in a sense, I think capture movement um, mm. if it is a well mixed quote unquote you know, population. Um, 
and I, 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 I mean, to David's point specifically, um, and then of course the growth hypothesis would be a little bit more tricky and we, and we need to look at that um, more closely, uh, hopefully with the, with the new odalists that are available. That of, co of course would require, I think, a little more spatial structure um, in the model that would be harder to capture. Um, so I don't know if there's other comments. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I, I mean, under the maybe strong assumption that the fish don't actually go into Oregon, <laughs> which, which I think there are, there are records of some fish moving from California into Oregon. Um, so it's, but you know, whether that's a very small fraction of the population or not, I don't know. Um, but I think that, it, you know, if we, if we still, if we, if we assume that fish don't cross borders, <laughs> then, um, the selectivity uh, using dome shaped selectivity would capture that. Um, that yeah, selectivity. under under your revised fleet structure, that that becomes a possibility, right? Because you're looking okay, at so. a north south split, so that's a new kind of structural advantage in evaluating that hypothesis. So that's good. And once you have the catches at that level, you could always break it into something more complicated down the road if more data were available. Mm -hmm. um, but those models what... make you do assumptions about allocation of recruitment and stuff like that. And it gets, mm. it gets scary. <laughs> Very uncertain as far as those parameters. Um, yeah, Cheryl Barnes had something to say here. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great, hey EJ. Um, I was trying to use the chat and it's not updating for me. So I don't know if you saw what I was trying to throw in there, but. Um, it's not throw... updating for me either, sorry. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, I guess, echo David's comments and throw a wrench in your hypothesis about that northward movement into Oregon waters, at least from the CCFRP recapture data. Um, we've seen that black rockfish move much more than any of the other rockfish species and, and some of them have moved northward into Oregon. And so I guess I'll just uh, add that there's a little bit more evidence. I mean, of course, recapture rates, we always, we always struggle there, but um, we see a good amount of movement and, and we kind of have been operating under that hypothesis that they move northward throughout their ontogeny. And um, yeah, maybe I can send you a link to the data or um, our publication that shows some of that. I would love to see that. Yeah, and, and uh, um, like I said, the question always comes down to what fraction of the population is moving that distance. Um, sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, I mean, and, and whether they're moving from like Northern California and Oregon or Southern, I mean, um, you know, the, the uh, were, were you, well, I guess we could, I'll, I'll look at the publication, then I can ask you questions. Yeah, this is all cent <laughs> Central Coast data, so I don't know what they've done since the statewide expansion and what sort of data they have from Southern California. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if that, that directionality and also, you know, if there's an increasing northward movement with time at liberty from tagging. Um, just be interesting to see the degree to which those are that ontogenetic aspect of it from the time of tagging to the time at which the fish is recaptured is <laughs> whether there's any, you know, uh, just random movement to the north and south or whether it's predominantly northward and increasing with time at liberty and indicative of kind of an ontogenetic movement. But yeah, John, I, think, I is... think it was the latter, but I'll, I'll send that along. This leave for the ODFW. The one thing that you we note though is that if we have missing old females all the way up from Kodiak all the way down to California, they're still missing as they get older. So this doesn't account for that old females. It can't be an ontogenetic movement unless the ontogenetic movement is beyond Kodiak. It's even further to the North Pole or something like that, or massively offshore. So. Um, you just have to, when you look, think about this, step back beyond just one state and step back to the whole West Coast as you think about it. So, yeah. Yeah. And one thing to bear in mind there, Leaf, is that, you know, this we're talking about just differences north and south of Point Arena within California for all lengths, not just for females. Um, this right. is larger fish to the north as a result of some other influence apart from the whole Heidemarkillum larger fish hypothesis, although that's kind of one of the potential. Uh, hypotheses here as to, you know, higher mortality for one reason or another in the south versus growth versus movement. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, a little bit different than the Heidemarkillum part in just in terms of just 
yeah, average size of your fish being smaller across the board, males and females, et cetera. Uh, let's see, Lynn, you had a little note here. Do you want to speak to that? Lynn said, I did a lot of surveys and observing in the Western uh, Gulf of Alaska, uh, BSAI, um, rare, not quite sure exactly what that is. Didn't Very see any. Island. Ah, thank you. All right. And I um, actually was the black rock fish manager for Kodiak and didn't see any black rock fish in any of my work. Once you got past toward the south end of the island, um, none of them around Kodi around Chignik, Sandpoint, out in the Aleutians anywhere. There's a few, you get them, we get a few reported on the commercial fish tickets, but not in any quantity once you get past the island. Hmm. All right, let's see if we have other hands up. Cheryl, your hand's still up. Did you have another thing to address? Nope, sorry, residual. Okay, oh, no sweat. All right. Um, and Scott <coughs> Malovich says, got a few tagged uh, black rockfish from California in the Newport area in the mid 2000s. So yeah, they do get up and move um, and it's, you know, there's quite a few that stay put for a short period of time, but yeah, they, they do get up and move, it seems. So we have another hand up, scrolling, looking for that, Teresa So. Um, I have a total different topic. So um, it's um, about the um, carcass lens. I remember um, what, at another workshop, this was brought up as an issue. So just if anybody is interested, um, we have prepared our data um, to show that the carcass lens and the um, whole fish lens, there was very um, little to no difference at all. So um, the concern was there are a lot of um, spore fish lens measurement was taken from the carcass. Um, so yeah, so just just wanted to let you know that if anybody interested, we can make those information available. All right, Jason Cope. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I I had that plot, and for some reason, I just forgot to put it into our our thing. But just to support what Teresa said, there was almost no difference. If folks want to see that right now, I'm happy to bring that up and show you. Hey, John, I'm going to stop sharing and it, maybe we'll just go into a more general questions. Yeah, than... unless there's, are there any more specific questions to California before we um, perhaps uh, move away to take a look at Jason, at Jason's um, slide? Okay, not not seeing anything further for California specific considerations. And since this is a, we're going into more of a generalized discussion, we can always circle back to California things as well. So um, that said, we can go ahead and uh, take a look at maybe what Jason had to show or more general considerations otherwise. Yeah, just give me a minute and I'll pull that, that plot up just so sure. people can see it. And EJ, did you have any follow up while he's doing that? No, um, I think uh, I, I just encourage people to please contact uh, me, and, and you know, one of the team will get back to you. We're going to be dividing things up into different, you know, just division of labor across topics. But one of us will get back to you um, with any questions. You know, if, if something comes up, if you think of something after the meeting, please, please don't hesitate. All right. Any other comments or questions that folks had while we're <coughs> while Jason's putting up the slide?
Okay. It's uh, 11.34 and we're scheduled to have this call go through to lunch. So we've got a little time left for a few more questions. So yeah, and I'm I'm still just looking for that that figure. I know I have it here. I don't know why it's not where I thought it was, but give, yeah, I'll I'll pop in. Sure. You'll see me share my screen when I get it. Okay, sounds good. Yes, um, one question for consideration. Uh, just in California, we have uh, a number of, well, samples that we've collected that are from uh, carcass lengths. Um, I know that there's been some carcass sampling that's taken place in Washington as well. Um, you know, as to the potential use of those in, in growth um, to increase sample size, et cetera. Great, um... I don't know if that's a, a critical um, need at this juncture uh, that might cause us to draw upon those potential carcass uh, collected otoliths, et cetera. Um, but just to say we have some of those as in addition to the whole lengths. Um, so just, it, is there any indication as to, if there's any indication as to whether those would be desirable, uh, then EJ, please let us know. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, if they're currently in use to some okay, degree in Washington. And Owen, uh, so, uh, did you have something that you wanted to share with the group? <clears throat> uh, nope, that was inadvertent. Okay, that's what. So, Jason, if you're still struggling, um, I put the Word document in the drive, the Google Drive. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to, for some reason, I'm having a hard time getting my Google Drive out because I know it's hiding in there. So I'll email you Just, a link real quick. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. John, uh, to your question, I think I, I would defer to Melissa Monk. I'm not sure if she's still on the call, but she's she's been working on uh, comparisons of uh, carcass length and whole fish length with some, uh, I believe, some Cal Poly students. Right. Yeah, that that work's been ongoing, uh, and I don't know the degree to which the the deficit would you know necessitate it if we were able to get our hands on some whole fish otherwise, um, especially with the defining growth, et cetera. Um, you know, there's always some error in your measurements of uh, any of the fish there with a the measuring board, et cetera. Once rigor mortis sets in and the jaw starts to lock up and fish is bent in a bag um, for a while. It can be a little challenging to straighten them out, uh, but in any event, that imparts some some measurement error just from the measuring board itself. Um, so I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see the degree to which, you know, uh, any of the potential bias falls within uh, the uh, the error and the measurements. Otherwise, although it's hard to tell <laughs> what the fish length would have been like if the fish were perfectly straight. All right, I got something for you here. <clears throat> Kristen Hinton put this together. Um, hopefully you can see this. Blow this up a little bit more. Okay, I think the, the bottom line here is that you have fish that are alive, meaning <laughs> they're fillets are on their bodies, they have heads, all those good things when you're alive, dead round length, and then blade length, you can see that these things are highly overlapping. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Kristen and was the oh, sorry, go treatment ahead. on those fillet lengths, were they, uh, was it to mm, let the backbone have its you know kind of catenary if you will or or sag uh or where they pulled backbones pulled tight i will let Kristen or others answer yeah. that one they they were laid on the table as we would normally do it so we didn't really yank them tight um they're just kind of <laughs> they're nice i guess um 
um, you know, flip the skin back over, made sure they were straight ish, but not like forcing them in any direction. Try to gain some natural kind of the orientation or, you know, semi straight back bone, but not stretching them out. It's tricky. I think they did 3 different measurement types um, in the analysis that Melissa had worked on um, uh, with uh, slow. Um, and uh, yeah, it, some of the, with the outcomes were somewhat at, to be expected. Pull them tight, you might get something a little longer, etc. Um, but yeah, then nothing doesn't. Yeah, no significant difference here. Um, but a slight, slightly smaller average for those guys, which you could understand if they were laying in somewhat of a natural orientation without the meat supporting the backbone. It's a reassuring plot. Thanks, Jason. All right. So I think that's that's the end of our presentations for black rockfish. Um, is there any uh, bigger picture questions uh, on other uh, species, um, just as follow ups, anything that occurred to folks that we want to talk about? Um, otherwise, uh, we'll draw things to a close and um, just offer the opportunity to for just public comment. Um, if there's any general statements that folks want to make. Um, this is the time to get that off your chest. All right, not seeing any hands. Hey, John, just, some, uh, just in, as an encouragement, just a reminder, I think a lot of the folks here are already tuned in, but this Friday we have our general stock assessment, uh, 10 to 11 first Friday meeting. So mm -hmm. if something comes up between now and then, you wanna talk about it in that forum, that's another place people can bring issues up. Definitely. Yes, and, and uh, you know, thanks to all the stats for um, their the presentations. It was a, a great window into uh, their efforts this far and what's planned. Um, if folks think of things, of course, contact the lead stats um, and make them aware of any concerns, considerations, etc. Um, this is, you know, pre-assessment workshops a great opportunity for presentation of the materials, but there's anything um, related to the considerations and the presentations that are available um, then, you know, or otherwise, if you have questions or things that folks should be aware of, please feel free to contact them. Um, appreciate everybody's contributions today and uh, yesterday. And um, the uh, chairs for the respective assessments will be writing up their notes and finalizing, finalizing those and there'll be a bit of back and forth. Um, and finishing those, um, I would propose that those be sent to the stats while things are still semi fresh by uh, next Friday, it's February 10th, and that feedback um, be provided uh, by midweek. That's the Wednesday, the 15th, and then that will allow the uh, chairs to finalize their. Uh, documentation by the 17th, just to allow some opportunity for a little back and forth to address any areas that might be unclear and unclear and uh, provide a, a finished document that reflects those discussions. So that's um, the, the timelines. Does that seem reasonable for you, John Field and, and Jason Schaffler? Or Jason may not be on the call. Does that work for you, uh, John Field and the stats? All right, I think I'll, I'll take the silence to be either that John isn't here. Yep, John's John's here. But um, yeah, I'll take that to be that um, folks see that as being a reasonable path forward. So that's the timeline for the plan there. Otherwise, um, more fun to come. Looking forward to the star panels and appreciate everybody's input. And uh, I think with that, We'll draw this to a close unless there's any comments from Marlene. John, I have one comment. Okay. I'll just interjecting with, with the comments back to the star panel chairs, that's simply for ensuring accuracy as opposed to any process step. Is that correct? 
That's correct. Yeah, it's just to allow some time for any clarifications and anything that's been provided there so that everybody's on the same page. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And agrees to the content. And We don't want to prescribe anything that's a misconception in terms of because these these, of course, will be used in um, identifying uh, considerations that were uh, brought up during our discussions that need to be addressed at the star panel. So there will be a follow up step to some degree. We want to make sure that the stats are um, agree with what's been identified as being an area for further evaluation. As some of these things may end up as research and data needs and be beyond the pale. Um, for what can be accomplished in the short term. So we just want to clarify what's on the table and what the expectations are and what's reasonable and those kind of back and forths. So you're not prescribed with anything that's unreasonable. Okay, Marlene, did you have any parting comments? Uh, no, I, I wanted to just thank everyone again for participating in the process. Um, this is what kind of helps make this process successful and um easier to move forward um with getting everyone on the same page so again i just thank everyone for their time in the last couple of days and for keeping things on track um very much appreciate that and you know the meeting website will uh continue to be up um with the materials provided so um if folks need to refer back um feel free to continue to reference that thanks a lot all right. Thanks, Marlene. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I think with that, we'll adjourn. Thanks, everyone.